gliding majestically over blue and white ocean swells. With acres of canopy-like sails and towering masts that seemed to scrape the sky, the Windjammer was the largest and one of the most versatile sailing ships ever built. It was also unique, the only large vessel powered by the wind that was constructed mainly of metal. This stout design, along with its myriad sails, made it perfectly suited for carrying cargo and passengers thousands of miles over often treacherous seas, all during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when the world was experiencing a period of unprecedented growth and industrial development. These great ships were significant for another reason. They were the very last of the commercial sailing craft, a line with a proud tradition dating back thousands of years. Even as the age of steam was dawning on the seas, ships like the Star of India, the Elissa, the Erzogen Setsiya, and the Peking became the stalwart cargo carriers of their day while evoking romantic images of days gone by. A large five-masted windjammer was around 400 feet long, with masts towering up to 170 feet above the deck. Its cavernous metal hull could hold up to 7,000 tons of cargo, yet was streamlined enough to move through the water at speeds approaching 15 knots. For the men who served aboard the mighty windjammers, Hauling thousands of tons of cargo to all corners of the globe was hardly romantic. In fact, it was grueling and often perilous. Still, despite many obstacles, the Windjammer captain and his crew sailed on. Withstanding the elements and an ever-changing world, they helped the Windjammer become the final embodiment of the Age of Sail, our legacy of tall ships in all their regal glory. Breaking the horizon with its clouds of sails, one of the rarest sights on the oceans today is a large sailing ship. But this one has become a familiar sight along the eastern seaboard of the United States and around the world. She is one of the most famous windjammers still plying the seas. The Coast Guard training ship Eagle. Built as the horse vessel in Hamburg, Germany in 1939, she was transferred to the United States Coast Guard following World War II. On her decks and among her soaring masts, generations of Coast Guard Academy cadets have been exposed to the extraordinary rigors and high level of teamwork that it takes to operate a large sailing ship like the Eagle. Training like this helps prepare these cadets for the challenges and hardships they will face during their service in the Coast Guard. But it also does something more it steeps them in the rich heritage of sail. A heritage that is shared and nurtured by a handful of other wind jammers around the world. Among these is the Star of India in San Diego, California. While the Eagle was one of the last wind jammers ever built, the Star was among the first. Launched at the Isle of Man on November 14, 1863, just five days before President Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address, she was originally named the Euterpe for the Greek muse of poetry and music. She was also something of a curiosity. Unlike most sailing vessels of the day, she had an iron framework and hull. 205 feet long, 35 feet wide, and with a hold 23 and a half feet in depth, her mainmast rose 125 feet above the deck. She displaced approximately 2,250 tons that could carry 1,200 tons of cargo. These dimensions made her considerably smaller than many later windjammers, yet her significance in historical terms would be far greater than her size or type of construction. She would go on to have a long and distinguished career, first as the Euterpe, then as the Star of India, a career that spanned the entire era of windjammers. Like other metal sailing ships of her kind, the Euterpe's many accomplishments are undeniable. But the term windjammer itself is somewhat more controversial, since it doesn't refer to any particular hull shape or configuration of sails. 
Windjammer is a word that sailors don't like very much because as members of any highly technical profession, people tend to like words that mean something specific. And windjammer is a pretty generic word, which is one of the reasons perhaps why it's so useful and why it survived. But initially, I think the consensus is that it was a derogatory term utilized by the crews of steamships. Historians have speculated that the word stems from an incident in which the men aboard a steamship derisively jeered a windjammer's crew as they attempted to jam their ship's sails around to capture the wind. But the sailors who manned these towering vessels quickly embraced the name, transforming it into an emblem of pride rather than shame. A seamless blend of industrial age manufacturing and old world craftsmanship these ships were the culmination of a long tradition of sailing vessels that began centuries before. From the earliest times of antiquity, ships of sail helped bolster the political ambitions, trade, and defense of nations throughout the world. With the increasing use of steam-powered vessels during the mid-19th century, however, the days of the great sailing ships appeared to be numbered. The advantages of steam in navigation were not so much speed as reliability of speed, the idea that you could plow through ice and currents with or without any wind. But the early steamships also had many flaws. Their engines were expensive to build and maintain. And with the new and relatively unreliable steam technology of the day, they were susceptible to mechanical breakdown. In addition, they needed coal to operate, lots of it, requiring frequent stops in port to refuel and relatively large crews to keep their boiler fires stoked. The coal also took up valuable space in the hull that could have been used for carrying cargo. These qualities made the early steamships economically viable on shorter trips, particularly carrying passengers or other low-bulk, high-value cargo where the vessel's lack of range and carrying capacity were not significant drawbacks. But it left a niche for the sailing ship on the long transoceanic voyages that steamships couldn't yet undertake on a regular basis. During the same period in the mid-19th century, nautical designers began experimenting with the construction of iron-hulled sailing ships, particularly in Great Britain. The first of the great wind jammers, the iron ships, were built in those industrial countries in Europe that were already well equipped for shipbuilding and had all the raw materials and the skilled labor at hand. On the Clyde River in Scotland, in Belfast, and in the northern part of England where there was coal and iron, where there were mines and refineries, and an overabundance of skilled labor. The Industrial Revolution had prepared the United Kingdom for this kind of work. In 1842, a British naval architect named John Grantham published a manuscript entitled Iron as a Material for Shipbuilding, in which he cited iron's many advantages compared to wood. Grantham based most of his arguments on why iron was superior to wood. Uh, it has a high tensile strength. It uh, allows you to build ships much larger in iron, theoretically, than you can in wood. It's not a number of pieces fitted together that work and torque rather independently. It, it is pretty much one single structure. As a consequence, you have ships that are less costly to operate, less costly to repair, and you can build them bigger. A year later, Grantham helped modify one of the first sailing ships with an iron hull, the 711-ton John Garrow, whose innovations included rigging made of iron cables instead of the less durable ropes used previously. Other shipbuilders of the time were making similar vessels. It was from this marriage of iron and canvas that the windjammer was born. With less internal bracing necessary in their metal hulls, the windjammers could carry greater amounts of cargo than contemporary wooden sailing ships, making them far more efficient as movers of freight. With no engines and no need to carry fuel, they could even haul more than comparably sized iron-hulled steamships. And despite their large dimensions, windjammers could be run by significantly smaller crews than the manpower-hungry steamers, making them cheaper to operate. Even though a lack of wind would paralyze a windjammer as surely as it would any other type of sailing ship, these vessels could also be fast. With its thousands of square feet of sails, the average windjammer driven by a strong gale was capable of outrunning its swiftest steam counterparts even while fully loaded with cargo. 
the famous steel-hulled German windjammer Herzogin Seitzia once reached a top speed of over 20 knots, a mark which not only far exceeded contemporary steamships, but even rivaled those attained by the fastest clippers. By the late 1800s, the windjammer had become the preferred vessel over wooden sailing ships for many thriving shipping businesses that hauled bulk raw materials over long distances. Most of the products, the cargoes that these vessels carried were industrial and agricultural raw materials, things that were needed for the burgeoning industries that were growing up in Europe and in America in the last part of the 19th century. They were bulk cargoes, uh, grain, wool, timber, coal. And one of the uh, characteristics that they had in common was they just really weren't perishable. And so the difficulties of getting around Cape Horn, the relatively slow passage through the doldrums under sail made very little difference in terms of the value of the cargo or the ultimate profits of the voyage. As the demand for raw materials grew worldwide, so did the size of the windjammers. Earlier models had featured only three masts, but by the end of the 19th century, larger four-masters became the norm, and eventually some five-masters were even built. Also, a configuration of exclusively square sails was gradually altered to include fore and aft sails on the rear mast. It was these reconfigured vessels called barks which became the classic windjammers of the era. The bark is really a minor variation of a standard full rig ship where you have all the masts carrying yards with the exception that on the aftermost mast there are no yards, there are no square sails carried uh, because frankly any time the ship is running off the wind or before the wind that much sail area that far back in the ship makes it hard to steer anyway. So by eliminating the yards on the aftermost mast you also eliminate the necessity of the crew required to work those yards whenever the ship is being brought about. Departing from their European home ports, these majestic ships sailed as far away as South America, the Pacific Northwest, and Australia, turning profits and earning praise from those who sailed them. Nevertheless, carrying tons of cargo on the wide open sea presented many challenges for those who sailed the windjammers, challenges that would make these devoted sea hands work harder than almost any other sailing crews in nautical history. For the captain and crew of a windjammer, carrying tons of valuable cargo over thousands of miles of unpredictable ocean was a grueling and often dangerous task. Raging seas could toss even the largest windjammers about like planks of wood. This often resulted in hazards such as shifting cargo, which could not only damage the goods, but cause a vessel to capsize. All of these potential hazards with these huge bulk cargoes could sink a ship Due care had to be taken with preserving the cargoes in that sense. And so a high level of expertise was very often required, merely in just loading the cargo. As a precaution, every windjammer captain rigorously drilled his crew for the moment a tempest would hit. Even on the fairest days, the crew undertook numerous precautionary chores to help keep the ship secure, including waterproofing decks, balancing freight, and securing safety lines. But above all, properly rigged and well-maintained sails and running rigging were essential to a windjammer's operation. If a storm was imminent, a ship's fairweather sails had to be replaced immediately with heavy-duty canvas. In strong winds, the smallest tears could rapidly grow into massive holes. Once during fierce winds off the coast of England, the Herzogin Seitzia lost 19 sails in less than a day and a half. Under such conditions, it was the captain who decided which sails were to be furled and unfurled in relation to the wind. At his word, the crew would hurriedly climb the rigging, and while balancing precariously on foot lines up to 150 feet above deck, adjust sail. The motto for these sailors was, one hand for ship, and the other for self. Clear communication between captain and crew was essential during this process. If the crew failed to synchronize their efforts, the results could be catastrophic. 
As with any merchant vessel, delivery of cargo intact and in the shortest amount of time was always the prime objective. Windjammer captain had to be a master of the sea, the skies, and his men. For the captain held full responsibility for his crew, his craft, and his hull. They had to be a great judge of character. Uh, they had to drive their men. Uh, they had to know when to drive hard. They had to know when to ease off. But they were all uh, masters at their craft. Ship owners counted on their captains to be vigilant, honest, and reliable, as a ship's fate, including its profit and loss, was entirely in his hands. As such, captains who proved their mettle were handsomely rewarded. A captain's quarters could be large and opulent, and he was often allowed to bring his family along on the voyage. It also imposed a kind of civilizing influence upon everyone to have women and children on board a ship. In some cases, women performed significant roles in managing vessels. Navigating, for instance, uh, wasn't uncommon at all for captains' wives to learn how to navigate and navigate a vessel. It wasn't certainly uncommon at all for masters' wives to be able to handle the vessel's books and uh, the more administrative functions of a captain's job. I suspect they were probably a welcome addition. Yet for all the moments of good living for the captain of a windjammer, there were many more of considerable stress. Life at sea was an ever-changing series of adventures, usually controlled by the elements. Every storm had the potential to sink a ship or blow it far off course. And nowhere was this more likely than at the southernmost tip of South America, where the Atlantic meets the Pacific at Cape Horn an unavoidable obstacle on the trade routes between Europe and the Pacific. That region of the world is known for violent, almost continuous gales and severe storms. What compounds a problem is that there's no large land mass there to break up the run of seas, which continue right around the world. So they reach gigantic sizes. And as a consequence, it's the one spot of the world most feared and most dreaded by mariners, and had been so since uh, the first attempts to get around it, extending back to the 16th century. The arduous journey of the three-masted bark British Isles epitomized the struggles the windjammers encountered in these waters. In June 1905, Captain James Platt Barker and his crew of 20 embarked on the Isles for a voyage from Wales to Chile delivering some 3,500 tons of coal. Nearly two months later, they passed Cape Horn going west during surprisingly moderate weather. However, within days, the temperature and barometer dropped sharply. Hurricane force winds drove the isles eastward, back past Cape Horn, then south towards Antarctica. During the ordeal, one man was washed overboard to his death. Thirty days later, the initial storm was over, but the winds were still strong enough to have pushed the ship within a hundred miles of the Antarctic Circle. Huge icebergs loomed dangerously near the beleaguered windjammer, sending her frostbitten crew into a panic. The ship's first mate brashly suggested that Barker had erred by not running for the safety of the nearby Falkland Islands when the storm first hit. But Barker was a fiery and stubborn man. He made it clear at pistol point that he alone was in control and that the voyage would not be abandoned. Unfortunately for Barker and his crew, the first storm they endured was like a summer breeze compared to what awaited them. Violent squalls soon lashed the isles as mountainous seas rolled over her. Two more men were swallowed by the sea, but through it all, her ruggedly built iron hull remained intact, a testament to the incredible strength of the Windjammer design. Finally, the British Isles was able to ride out the storm and set a northerly course. Four and a half months after her departure, she reached the port of Pisagua, Chile, her cargo somehow still intact. Despite hardships like those endured by the British Isles and countless other craft, the use of windjammers continued to grow worldwide. At the beginning of the 20th century, over 3,000 windjammers from more than a dozen countries were registered with the insurance company Lloyd's of London. They had become a multi-million dollar business that employed over 500,000 people worldwide. It was the golden age of the windjammers, and rising to dominate this era were two rival companies, one in Germany, the other in France, who created windjammer fleets that would leave the competition in their wakes.
In 1825, an eccentric entrepreneur from Hamburg, Germany named Ferdinand B. Leitz started a firm to export silk hats to South America. By the middle of the century, he was joined by his son, Carl, and they began expanding their business. Using their own ships, they profited handsomely and diversified into exporting a variety of materials to overseas markets. As their shipping volume increased, so did the size of their ships. In 1856, Carl ordered the construction of a new 140-foot windjammer, the company's first. Carl Leitz named uh, the Poodle after his wife, who was known as Poodle because of her luxuriant curls. And the ship was not only pretty, she was also very profitable and successful, and they had her quite, quite a while. And in efforts to perhaps sustain the run of good luck they found with that ship, they named all their subsequent vessels, or renamed them uh, with words beginning with P. And that was the birth of what became one of the most famous lines of sailing ships uh, ever. It was called the Flying P Line. Recognizing the growing demand in the world economy for nitrates, a chemical compound used in fertilizers, the lights geared the operations of the Flying P Line almost entirely toward this profitable but malodorous cargo. It was just a horrible sort of a trade. Aromatic, extraordinarily hot. Imagine taking a lot of fertilizer and exposing it to equatorial heat for weeks and months at a time while you loaded it on your ship with a shovel. It was hardly glamorous, but it certainly was lucrative and absolutely necessary to burgeoning agriculture. Despite the nature of their cargo, the captain and crews who sailed aboard the P-liners took great pride in their vessels and their company's reputation. Sailing legends like Captain Robert Hilgendorf enhanced this prestige. In his 20-year career with the Lights Company, Hilgendorf successfully sailed around Cape Horn 66 times, mainly in windjammers, once making the dreaded passage in just seven days. One of the interesting things in this period is individual captains don't emerge as, as cult figures very much, unlike with the clipper ships. Hilgendorf is a bit different. He was so proficient and was, was consistent in making exceedingly good passages that he achieved notoriety in a period and a profession where notoriety was a very rare commodity. A master of how to handle a large uh, windjammer at sea knowing all of the angles, knowing all of the intricacies of handling uh, craft. Mr. Lights had on his office wall a portrait of not his father or grandfather, but Robert Helgendorf. Although the number of windjammers in the Lights fleet remained fairly constant at around 16 during its 100 years of operations, the size of these ships continued to increase. In 1895, the Lights built their first five-masted ship, the Potosi, which made an instant name for itself because of its surprising speed. The average duration for a run to Chile from Hamburg was around 80 days. The Potosi under Captain Hilgendorf did it in 66. Yet the greatest of the P-liners was still to come. In 1902, the Lights Company unveiled the biggest and most advanced windjammer yet, the mighty Preussen. Known as the Queen of the Seas, she was a giant a superbly crafted ship that would set new standards in windjammer design. She measured 440 feet from bow to stern, had five masts carrying 48 sails, and displaced an amazing 11,150 tons, making her one of the largest sailing ships ever built. In a stiff breeze, she could attain speeds of 17 knots, her sails exerting a force comparable to 6,000 horsepower. Even her average cruising speed of about seven knots was swifter than most large steamers. The Preussen was a climactic expression of the sailing ship. She was the pride at the time she was built, not only of the lights line, but arguably of German seafaring technology and even of the entire brotherhood of, uh, of seamen who were engaged in this grand enterprise. Yet sadly, the reign of the Queen of the Seas was all too brief. In 1910, she was accidentally rammed in the English Channel by a steamship. The great windjammer floundered for several hours before the powerful tide slammed her against the crags off the cliffs of Dover. After several efforts to dislodge her failed, she was soon battered into oblivion by the surf. Even with the demise of the Preussen, the Lights Company still flourished. 
The only genuine threat to its dominance in the nitrate market came from France, where another family operation, the A.D. Boards Company, produced a fleet of wind jammers that were just as proficient and structurally sound. The core of the competition between the two shipping giants was speed. Much like the great tea races in the days of the Clippers, the wind jammers from these companies continuously vied with each other for the fastest passages back and forth across the ocean. In 1896, the board's five-masted bark France completed a voyage from Europe to South America and back in 145 days. Lights Potosi made a similar trip in 144 days. Such competition was not uncommon during the reign of the wind jammers. The great grain races from Australia to Britain during the 1920s and 30s would also serve as a friendly battleground for a number of ships, captains, and their crews. Meanwhile, business for both the lights and boards companies continued to thrive throughout the early part of the 20th century, particularly as World War I erupted in 1914 and the demand for raw materials skyrocketed. It was during this conflict that one ship would make a name for itself in an entirely different fashion, giving rise to one of the most dramatic Windjammer stories ever told. At the beginning of World War I, the German Imperial Navy found itself in a quandary. The powerful British Royal Navy was blockading its fleet in their home ports, making it virtually impossible for any of Germany's surface warships to launch attacks on Allied military or commercial vessels. The German situation on the eve of World War I was the same situation of, of any second-class power when confronted by a, a nation that has command of the sea, which the Britain had with the Royal Navy. And that was to embark upon what was called a guerre de course, that is, warfare upon trade. German U-boats were able to elude the blockade, but because of their limited fuel capacity, their strikes were largely confined to areas around the nearby British Isles. Any long-range surface raiding would have to be carried out by specially modified and camouflaged merchant vessels that could sneak through the British cordon to attack Allied shipping in distant waters. It was in this role that the Windjammer secured its place in naval history. For in its robust and elegant form, one man saw the makings of a stealthful and deadly warship his name was Count Felix von Luckner of the Imperial German Navy. Von Luckner had sailed on wind jammers as a teenager. He realized that these numerous vessels were unassuming, yet fast and large, and that their metal construction would allow them to withstand barrages that would shatter wooden ships. At the outset of the war, he suggested his plan to Kaiser Wilhelm, who dismissed it as preposterous. Von Luckner responded that therein was the very reason it would work. The British would never suspect something so implausible. The Kaiser was finally persuaded, and Von Luckner was given permission to secure and modify a windjammer that would become notorious as the Raider Sea Adler, or Sea Eagle. In addition to installing a supplemental diesel engine, workmen also mounted two powerful cannon which were concealed on deck. The vessel's cargo hold was so immense that von Luckner was able to build secret panels and passageways so the German sailors could rush out of hiding on the deck if necessary. Von Luckner was so convinced that this project would work that he even allocated space behind fake walls to serve as a holding area for up to 400 prisoners. The difference between a U-boat and what it could do and the Sea Adler and what it could do was the Sea Adler could actually evacuate everyone on the merchant ship, hold them as prisoners until they could land them in a neutral port and sink the steamer. And that wasn't sufficiently offensive to risk bringing other countries into the war. Since von Luckner had learned to speak Norwegian fluently during his many travels, he decided that the Windjammer's cover would be as a Norwegian merchant carrier. Dressing the part, he went to extraordinary lengths to disguise both his ship and his personally selected 60-man crew. He even appointed one of his youthful sailors to portray his wife, Josephine, in the event they were boarded. From the moment she took to the sea in 1916, the refurbished windjammer proved successful in her deception. Lulled by the ship's graceful appearance, Allied vessels allowed her to come near where she would reveal her hidden guns and demand the ship surrender. The ruse worked time and time again. 
He captured American vessels, French barks, British barks, and in each and every case, he would put a shot across the bow, then he would interview the captain and tell him what he intended to do. When the vessel finally hove to and surrendered, he would bring the people on board his vessel and then, of course, plant the charges and sink the ship. Von Luckner reveled in his success. Nevertheless, he made sure that the crews of the Seattle's victims were treated more as guests than prisoners. He drank champagne and cognac with them, and even provided books, playing cards, and phonograph records. Von Luckner was a German aristocrat, as opposed to the standard run of German merchant officers who tended to be more middle class. He was raised and, and bred to be a gentleman, and he carried his role out in the same vein that, that Francis Drake had several centuries earlier, creating a reputation for being hospitable and gracious to his guests while he had them, and um, uh, pursuing his version of warfare with the, the maximum amount of gentility as circumstances allowed. By 1917, the Say Adler had destroyed 14 vessels on a seven-month hunt that had taken her 30,000 miles into the mid-Pacific. Ironically, several of the ships she sank were merchant windjammers. Yet throughout these triumphs, only one Allied sailor was killed. Von Luckner possessed a sense of chivalry that seemed to belong to an earlier era, just like his tall and regal ship. He had a swagger, he was an actor, he attracted people to him. There's no question that he was the, the last of the great uh, sea raiders. On August 2nd, 1917, the hazards of the sea finally accomplished what the Allied navies could not. The Sea Adler ran aground on an uncharted reef near the Society Islands. Foreseeing his own eventual capture by Allied navies, von Luckner reluctantly ordered his vessel be set ablaze, rather than see it fall into enemy hands. With her demise came the end of an age. It was the last time that a large sailing vessel would serve as an active warship in a major navy. World War I had taken its toll on the merchant windjammers as well. The Boards Company of France lost nearly half its fleet of 46 active vessels in the conflict. And with advancing technology making steamships far more economical to operate, there seemed little sense for ship owners to replace the lost barks with new windjammers. Yet across the Atlantic and America, there was still one proud vessel that continued to resist the effects of time and the elements. One that would endure to become a standard bearer for all the windjammers that followed her. In 1923, just five years after the end of World War I, a battered old windjammer named the Star of India was retired by her owners. Once a state-of-the-art vessel known as the Euterpe, she had served over two generations in a working career that had spanned the entire era of the windjammers. Like most others of her type, she was a victim of changing times, which had rendered all but a handful of windjammers around the world obsolete. Since her launch in 1863, the Star of India had been tangible proof of the Windjammer's incredible versatility, successfully performing every mission that had been assigned to her. From the India cargo trade, to transporting immigrants, to working the waters of Alaska in the salmon fishery. Although her heritage was proud, her origins were humble, if not ill-fated. In 1864, on her maiden voyage as the Euterpe, she was en route with various merchandise from Liverpool to Calcutta when she was clipped across the bow by another ship. After some hasty repairs, she managed to complete her voyage. The following year, the Euterpe was battered by a fierce cyclone off Madras in the Indian Ocean. Conditions worsened to the point that her captain had no choice but to order the crew to cut her masts away to keep the wind from capsizing the ship. As the storm abated, the beleaguered crew was able to erect improvised masts and the ship safely reached land. Ironically, part of the reason the Euterpe was able to survive these early trials may have stemmed from a flaw in her design. Unlike later windjammers, like the Preussen, she had been built at a time when few shipbuilders had extensive experience in constructing metal vessels. As a result, the Euterpe's designers had spaced her ribs more closely than they needed to be. 
as if they were made of wood instead of the stronger iron. When you look at, at Euterpe, what you're seeing in some respects is an attempt to duplicate a wooden ship in iron. Uh, her structure is, is quite similar. You don't see lots and lots of diagonal strapping as you might see in later on construction. Um, you see fairly massive plates, 13 sixteenths of an inch thick, uh, fairly massive uh, frames on, spaced on close centers. This made the ship heavier and slower than some other wind jammers, but unquestionably more rugged. In 1871, the Euterpe was sold to a Shaw Saville company who used her to transport immigrants from England to New Zealand and Australia. Gold miners, farmers, and adventurers crowded on board, awaiting the promise of a better life oceans away. Uh, it was really over long uh, ocean passages, uh, such as prevailed between Europe and New Zealand, Europe and Australia, uh, that you found ships like this turn to delivering people as well as cargo. And this ship uh, operated for two decades, carrying immigrants from the 1870s to the 1890s. Yeah, I'm told that uh, there's quite a sizable percentage of the population in New Zealand that one way or another can trace their ancestry to people who came to New Zealand on this particular ship. As the end of the 20th century drew near, the Euterpe was sold again and put into service as a freighter for hauling lumber. But her venture in this rugged trade was short-lived, and the constant thrashings by the sea and wind continued to take their toll on her now aging frame. In January of 1901, in her fifth decade afloat, the ailing Euterpe was purchased by the Alaska Packers Association, where she joined the other aging wind jammers of the APA fleet and the Alaskan salmon trade. The first thing her new owners did was give the venerable wind jammer a much needed overhaul. Her interior was cleared out, new decks were laid, and berthing space was provided for 75 fishermen and 150 cannery workers most of whom were Asian. It was at this time that the ship was modified from a square-rigged vessel into a bark. And one of the first things they did to her was make her yet more economical by taking out her existing mizzenmast and putting in a smaller one. And she became, uh, by that change, a bark. That allowed her to be operated with a smaller crew. In the spring of 1902, she sailed her inaugural round trip from San Francisco to Alaska. A 2,500-mile trek she would make once each year for the next 21 years. Once in the Gulf of Alaska, she lay at anchor while her crewmen put off in smaller boats to harvest the area's abundant stocks of salmon. She would ferry their collective catch to canneries ashore, and at summer's end, she'd set sail for San Francisco, her holds loaded to capacity with processed salmon. In 1906, in keeping with the names of the other stars in their fleet, the Euterpe's owners renamed her the Star of India. But by 1923, the venerable star had finally outlived her usefulness. As to whether she was worn out, she was probably less economical by virtue of not being as big as some of the others. And therefore, the economy of scale was no longer in her favor. And being one of the older ships, she was certainly a candidate for replacement. Many of her sister ships in the APA line were sold, ultimately to be replaced by a fleet of steamers. As for the Star of India, she sat idle, destined either for the scrapyards or obscurity. But fate would smile on her once again. In 1926, the Zoological Society in San Diego bought her for $9,000, intending to transform her into a floating aquarium. To take an old ship that was an everyday item, bring her here and set her up as a museum was a bold step. And apparently it was too bold because so shortly after that the Depression came along and th there was no longer the wherewithal to be able to engage or embark on a project like that. Ships like this are very labor intensive. Even just sitting, they take an enormous investment to keep up. She became something of a curiosity cabinet on the waterfront and a derelict and also something of an embarrassment. The star remained idle in San Diego Harbor for decades time and neglect accelerating her decline. But in 1957, the highly regarded Australian windjammer captain and author, Alan Villiers, visited San Diego and saw the star in her dilapidated state. Dismayed by the lack of attention being given to one of the last of history's great ships, he urged San Diego citizens to preserve her. 
the community responded almost immediately with donations of money and materials. Carpenters and other craftsmen volunteered their services, and new life was breathed into the star. The Star of India became a focus of civic pride, as it were. Initially, there was some question as to whether the ship was preservable. By the late 1960s, the question was whether you take this priceless artifact out and risk it at sea. That question was answered on July 4th, 1976, over 50 years after her retirement. Amid the tumult of America's bicentennial celebration, with hundreds of thousands of well-wishers gathered on shore and on boats, the grand old Windjammer sailed again. Her noble appearance was ample reward to her benefactors for the countless hours of hard work they had devoted to her. The Star of India now rests at the waterfront in San Diego, a lasting tribute to the rich heritage represented by these unique vessels. Being part of a large number of people that care a tremendous amount about this ship and taking care of her uh, is a source of immense satisfaction, making her accessible to people, making her story understandable, seeing the parade of, of people of all ages come on board and recognize what they're on, the unique nature of her, and just become part of her story. It's immensely rewarding, and I can't imagine, no matter what I do after this, or could do after this, that would ever give as much satisfaction or ever be as great an honor as being able to say, I uh, take care of this ship on a day-to-day -day basis. The star still takes to the sea on occasion, a magnificent reminder of one of the most remarkable kinds of ship ever driven by the wind. Sailing vessels have always exhibited a personality all their own, and no ships expressed this more beautifully than the Windjammers. There's no experience like being on a big wind jammer when she's really got a bone in her teeth and she's moving along at that tremendous rate of speed. The sound is indescribable. The sound of the, of the wind in the rigging, everything being bar taut with strain. And of course, when you go into the bow and then over onto the bowsprit and you look at that enormous bow wave and you hear this crashing of the sea as the vessel shoulders its way through, it's the most awesome experience of my life. John Macefield called them tall ships, the poet laureate of England. And nowadays we can look at these vessels and see them, and there are several of them that survive, see them as some of the greatest relics of the age of sail. It's arguably the case that the Star of India in San Diego and the Alyssa in Texas, both of them wind jammers of this latter age, are among the greatest of the ship restorations, certainly the loftiest and the largest. Well done, the pride of their local cities, uh, because we've come to see them as the swan song of a great age, uh, the very last of their kind. With their rippling sails lofting above the spray, the wind jammers that still ply the oceans are masterpieces of artistry and efficiency. Mighty vessels that represent the zenith of an era. It is an era that will live on through these proud and stately iron ladies of the sea. <laughs>